Welcome back to The Mining Pod. On today's show, we're joined by Jan Chopik of Brains, after a word from our sponsors. Did you know that you can make more money by merge mining other networks? Check out makemoremoneymining.com for information on BIPs 300 and 301, a proposal to bring more revenue to Bitcoin miners through sidechains and merge mining called drive chains. Increase your mining revenues and learn more about participating in Bitcoin governance by visiting makemoremoneymining.com. Are you a miner who wants to activate Bitcoin improvements? Check out activation.watch. See what Bitcoin improvements the Bitcoin community, developers, and miners are considering and show support by signaling for one of many BIPs up for consideration. Activation.watch. Hey, Mining Pod, I'm Lee Bratcher, president of the Texas Blockchain Council. The Texas Blockchain Summit is now the North American Blockchain Summit. The same emphasis on policy, energy, and Bitcoin mining, but now expanded by working with our partners across the country. We've got great sponsors lined up like Riot, Marathon, GDA, CleanSpark, BitDeer, Lancium, Cormant, Compass, HTS, Crypto Power, Priority Power, Sonoda, and many more. Solidify your next deal or JV or just come for the networking on November 15th through 17th in Fort Worth, Texas, for the third annual North American Blockchain Summit. We'll see you there. Are you a retail or institutional investor interested in Bitcoin mining companies? The Miner Mag brings you free data and analysis from all major NASDAQ listed Bitcoin mining operations to know who stands out. Check out visualized metrics and data dependent stories at theminermag.com. Today we have Brains, Jan Chopik. Welcome to the show. How are you doing? Uh, thanks for having me here. I'm pretty good. Cool. Well, I've been seeing a lot of you guys, uh, the Brains team, floating around the world. You guys went from Honey Badger to Hong Kong and a few conferences in between. And before we dive into talking about control boards and mining pool stats and all that stuff, I was just curious, like, how is the the conference circuit? Well, if you're a company based in, in the center of Europe in Prague, you have to have your team flying around and meeting the actual mining guys. There's not much mining in the Central Europe really happening, but we happen to be the company from there produ- providing some products uh, related uh, and supporting Bitcoin mining stack. So, yeah, I mean, that's sort of like, a, I don't want to say like a daily business, but it's like a yearly business. That's a couple couple events that we definitely don't want to miss from the calendar. And uh, Honey Badger is actually one of them that like our team goes there really regularly every year. And essentially... This was the first conference back in 2018 where we announced Brains OS. So uh, there is some uh, uh, tradition that draws us back to to that place and venue. Yeah, is there is there any conference that you're like I have to hit this one every year? The Brains team has to hit this one every year because there's there's Honey Badger, yeah. there's the Hong Kong every year with Bitmain. Uh, there's like three or four in Austin per year, and then there's of course like the, the larger ones like Consensus permissionless, things like that. Uh, for people just like interested in the industry, like which ones have you found to be like the highest signal? Well, for us as a company providing the mining shovels essentially in the software field for now, and also entering the hardware, uh, we definitely want to be uh, at the disrupt, the mining disrupt. Uh, sure, the big ones like Bitcoin 2023 20 this year, uh, Bitcoin Amsterdam is also some place uh, is a place where uh, you can meet our team. Uh, I know there is specific Bitcoin happening in a few weeks, isn't it? So that's where we are going to be for sure. Uh, actually, there's a proof of work conference in Prague, like right now, where where our yeah. guys are, and and some people from the US actually came over as well, and we got to meet them. So you'll find us at, at the major events where, where the miners are. One, one event that I actually do regret not attending last year, but it was like really crazy year in terms of the events was the skiing Bitcoin. Like I, yeah. I'm a, I've been skiing since I was three years old. So I, I was thinking like, I, it was, I think there were like two events in the row and I just decided going just for one, but they like technically I could have stayed in the states for two years, but then it's a bit uh, complicated with family yeah. and stuff. So, <laughs> no, that's a great event. Uh, Amanda does an amazing job with it. So if you come out, we should definitely hit some hit some runs together. I've been skiing since I was a little kid, also. So yeah. I'm a huge fan of that event. Also ran some podcasts out there last time. We we ran it in the ski lodge in the basement, and it was a terrible recording setup. But we like kind of. <laughs> gutted it out. I recorded with Fred from Marathon and Zach from Clean Spark. Uh, and then also, 
um, Dan from Foreman and Dan, we did it in a separate room, but yeah, we did it in the basement of a ski lodge and people were walking by with their ski boots. And th- there was like a lot, a of, lot this, of noise. <laughs> yeah. There was a lot of noise background, but it sounded kind of cool because I like, I prefaced it and was like, Oh, we're in a ski lodge. So you're going to hear some noises. And so there's some ambient background noise, if you will. And it, it worked out pretty well. So and if you come, let me know. Cause that's definitely a good spot. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, well, you kind of hinted at where I want to go first, and that's talking about control boards. And we'll get later into like Brain's pool. I definitely want to talk about uh, the pool itself. But control boards are the new thing that you guys are pushing. There are obviously a lot of competitors uh, on that on that market as well right now. I feel like a lot of people are launching control boards at the moment. I, I want to go through like your guys' product line and, and hear the pitch on it and hear like all the engineering details you guys have put into this. Uh, that miners are interested in, and then I have some follow up questions about like sort of the, the business side of things. Okay, uh, so the whole story with the control boards—that's something that we have been thinking about for past few years. Uh, but we were like, okay, that's a niche market, and essentially at the times of S9s or back in the day of S17s, which was next major milestone in the mining hardware developer speaking of and miners. Uh, by that time, the machines were still kind of open. So there was really no good need or incentive to build uh, a separate control board as long as you could basically freely install uh, any aftermarket firmware onto the control board. But then the policy of the of the, manuf- of the manufacturer changed uh, for various reasons. The official reasons were like computer uh, security, but uh, and like warranty reasons, but uh, I kind of don't buy this story. Um, what what they did is essentially introduced uh, something. It's that's called uh, Secure Boot. So essentially, it's it's present in in laptops. You can enable it. Essentially, what it means is that a computer refuses to boot anything that is not signed by a specific key. But in case of uh, normal computers, you can actually configure this public key used for verifying the signature of your operating system if you want to get that geeky or you can rely on uh, on the pre-signed uh, kernels and operating system images from uh, the vendors and that's sort of the let's say i would call it it's it's an optional end user security but here it's essentially enforced by the manufacturer uploading uh, the the key or to be precise a hash of the public key into an OTP memory that's one time programmable in the control board once it's burned in there is actually hardware obstacles preventing booting anything else um, that makes it uh, very difficult to actually run aftermarket firmware there are options to do it through an SD card uh, technically, there are some exploits floating around, and so on. So that th- this was actually the, the the final kick that made us uh, rethink that idea of the control board as an alternative for any new uh, hardware that's being introduced to the to the market uh, that will provide an a, let's say safe alternative that if you're desperate, like you want to run. Uh, aftermarket firmware like Brains OS on your machine and let's say that's a new type of control board that is not supported yet for various reasons you still have the option uh, take uh, our control board plug it in and run it because the miner really is not about the control board it, it's about the hash boards about the chips that are actually doing the proof of work algorithm the rest is just, uh, let's say, management uh, that ne- that needs to be done in order to fe- keep the chips busy all the time and collect the results from them. So this this was the the thinking um, with a control board. Uh, for us, it's also a, a sort of a test bet um, that we are able to produce uh, that piece of hardware at the reasonable quality and scale, uh, so that we. In the future, when eventually there is something that we call internally brains miner available in the market, uh, this is just one component of it. So we're, we have an uh, like agenda behind just providing uh, the control board. I think like Epic guys actually went the other way around. They already had the full box, but uh, I think uh, the Intel project somehow went south. I, I don't know all the details really, uh, but they basically took out the the control board and started selling it as well. So uh, 
having the the competitor that's that's also an interesting situation but i would say in general uh in the industry it's always good when there are multiple alternatives uh for your firmware of choice uh, for sure uh, i would be most happy if the firmware of your choice is brains os uh but it still goes back to the fact that normally you're not able to run any aftermarket firmware easily on any of the recent machines because of the reason that I stated. And it's quite surprising that the customers are actually not pushing the manufacturers to opening this up again. Uh, even, uh, you know, like if you take a, uh, an, an Android cell phone as an example, if you buy the, this piece of hardware nowadays, it's always an opt-in uh, where you can actually unlock the bootloader to, uh, you know, upgrade it or overwrite it with a different firmware in exchange, let's say, for a warranty. These machines typically have like one year warranty. And after that, you should be, I mean, you can do it even before that, but this should be the proper approach, basically saying, okay, the machine is locked for, 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 and the true reason is not security. The true reason is that I don't want our users to mess with the hardware, uh, because we don't want to be held liable for, for some, for any issues related to running aftermarket firmware. But if you want to do it, you just have to unlock it this way. If you do it, then, uh, it's actually burned in the control board and you will not be able to apply the warranty, whatever. Uh, that means there are, there are there there would be a solution to to having this flexibility in the hardware, but uh, apparently the push from the the customers is not strong enough enough towards the manufacturers uh, to do something like this. Uh, and it's pretty much like all the same. Bitmain is doing the same as the micro BT. Like they 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 don't act uh, as I would imagine as a normal manufacturer should act. So taking a step back really quickly, there's BeagleBone, there's AmLogic, like Luxor just launched one, Epic has one, I mean, there's other like stock ones out there. Can you walk us through uh, the control board market and, and tell me a little bit about each single one as you see them from Brain's perspective? And and if not that, at the very least, kind of tell me a little bit about how like the, the Brain's control board is separate from some of those out there. Um, Really quick context for this. The thing I always hear is people really like the Beagle Bone. They they always like try to find those, but they're harder to find on the market right now. Apparently, um, if that's okay. correct, feel free to uh, dispute that. But uh, let, I'd be curious speak, to get your thoughts. Yeah, let me speak to that. Uh, so, if we start from Beagle Bone, um, I think this was the first, uh, let's say, precursor to show or demonstrate uh, how the hardware can be locked to for the user. Uh, so that's the first control board that has the, the secure boot enabled. I like. I personally think that the BeagleBone control board is the least powerful piece of hardware out there. And even though um, it is possible to to use it um, throughout uh, the the whole Bitmain product range, uh, even with Brains OS uh, with an SD card, or we can talk about the installation later. Um, the power actually limits the the features that you have uh, in the operating system in terms of like you get all the features, but the performance. And I'm not speaking about hash rate. I'm speaking about the times when uh, the machine is doing some tuning, and like it, these times get extended because simply the CPU is not powerful enough to keep the chips uh, busy. So you have to uh, run the chips at basically higher difficulty. Uh, than you would like to. Uh, then the second one, AmLogic, that's actually a slightly or actually a much better piece of hardware. That's, uh, I think, a four-core uh, four core machine, um, four-core control board. And that allows the luxury of basically devoting one core per hash board for feeding the jobs and collecting the results. Um, but that's also one of the control boards that also has the secure boot. Then... Uh, the third type uh, that's that had been used originally on S9s, and that's a very nice and flexible piece of hardware. It's it's called Zinc. It's a CPU on uh, the Zinc CPU is essentially a hybrid uh, of a dual core CPU plus a small FPGA. FPGA is Field Programmable Gate Array. So uh, essentially, part of the firmware can be synthesized 
into the FPGA uh, as sort of gates that can do certain things. And uh, in case of uh, the, the Bitmain machines, the FPGA is being used to stream the jobs and collect the results from the chips so that the main CPU uh, is not uh, overloaded with keeping the chips busy. Um, that's actually a very powerful piece of hardware. The problem is the price of the of the CPU, uh, which is probably like double of what you pay for uh, AM Logic or what you pay for uh, the CPU that we have in our control board. Um, and I think uh, there was also a problem with uh, availability of these components. So there were like multiple factors that I believe uh, pushed uh, Bitmain to stop using it. Then uh, the recently they have introduced yet another one. Uh, it's called Svitek. That's some Chinese uh, set of box chip um, that uh, again makes our life more difficult uh, in terms of installing Brains OS and running it. Um, then if we speak about some competing hardware like uh, MicroBT, uh, they built their uh, control boards on top of all winner chips, which is, again, a Chinese uh, uh, chip typically used in uh, setup boxes or any multimedia devices. Uh, but fortunately, the all winner chip is quite well, let's say, documented, and most of the drivers are actually... Uh, in the upstream Linux kernel. Uh, so that's that's it. Uh, in terms of performance, the all winners are pretty decent. I would probably put them somewhere at the AM logic uh, level. Um, I think this pretty much recaps uh, the two main manufacturers. Then as far as I know, there is Canon. Um, and Canon uh, uses actually, or has been re until recently, and that still lasts, using uh, what we call a bare metal uh, system. So that is essentially, uh, we don't call it a CPU, but it, we call it microcontroller unit MCU that doesn't have an extra memory. It has everything built in the chip. So it's like system on chip, but like full system on chip without memory. Uh, that means it's a very limited system with very limited resources. You are not able to run uh, any reasonable operating system like Linux. Uh, so the tools that you have available in the firmware are limited there's actually none like you don't think of the uh canon machines as if you can just log in with ssh it's it's a bare metal uh control board uh one advantage that this approach actually has is uh it's quite uh difficult to have like viruses or any malicious uh, things happening to the system because uh, it's basically a custom built piece of software from from basically from scratch even though probably it's running some our, our real-time operating system underneath but uh, that's slightly different domain um, so this is like a separate trend. What is attractive about this approach, obviously, is the price because the MCUs that are not like the full system are cheaper. Uh, you don't have to pay for the rest of the peripherals like DDR uh, and so on. The overall board layout, the control board layout is uh, more simple. But the drawbacks are you you basically don't have a full full system. So you if, if you want any extensions, special monitoring, special APIs, anything, any automation that you would like to customize on the machines, if, if you had like a proper login, because that's actually also the problem. Like if you put aside the, the fact that you buy a machine, but you really don't own it because you don't have a full admin login, you, you don't have the root access into the machine unless you sort of like break in, exploit it, jailbreak into it. Uh, if you had this, as in the old days, you can, uh, as a farm, develop, let's say, custom firm software that is uh, in the form of some agents that are running on, on your machines doing certain things. So this is totally out of out of question unless unless you uh, exploit it, the, the machines and, and break into it. Um, so this would be from the standard manufacturers. Um, I have noticed uh, recently Desiva, uh, that was the miner introduced in Mining Disrupt. They also, I think, use uh, actually a, a beautiful set of like uh, one CPU, one MCU, and an FPGA on their control board. So it's it's a very complex uh, a system design. Uh, most of the chips are 
uh, made in China. So again, it would be very difficult to find the specs and all these kind of things. Um, so this is uh, speaking about the, the current manufacturers. Then there is uh, us and let's say Epic, uh, who basically took a very similar approach. Uh, considering us, we are uh, based in Prague. Uh, STM is a, is a European company that produces uh, microcontrollers and one of their systems is or systems on chip uh, is capable of running Linux and we actually use uh, chips from them because they're basically across the street where we are. So we get a very wonderful support. Uh, coincidentally, I noticed that Epic guys basically use almost the same chip. I, I don't know if, like, if it's like literally uh, the same uh, part number, but uh, they also built their control board over over STM. What we like about STM is the level of support, the level of uh, standardizations in terms of data sheets. Like, so if you, if you want to use the peripheral, uh, you get the full specification, basically the standard way what an embedded systems engineer is used to when you're building a new system. So you buy an off-the-shelf part, you get the full specification data sheets, some developer kit, SDK, and you can start from there. Uh, you don't have to spend time on figuring things out or reverse engineering uh, or anything like that. Um, so this is us uh, in Epic. Um, as of the features of the control board. So what we project is uh, essentially three to four control, three to four hash boards. So we have four uh, sockets, even though the standard enclosure of an end miner has only three hash boards. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be people around messing with it and trying to connect multiple uh, multiple hash boards. So we'll see what happens. Uh, the control board fits the X19 enclosure in most cases. So the, all the J's, J Pros, J Pro Plus, XP's, and so on that they, the, this, these models do fit. What is not supported as of now are the older or the, the very first generation of S19s that were built on top of the BM1398 chip, which is not being used anymore. The latest XPs have, I think, 1366. So that's uh, probably a walk through uh, the full awesome. board hardware. Ask questions if, if I skipped uh, anything that you would be interested in. No, that was great. That was, that was honestly yeah, fantastic. Yeah. And uh, I know a lot of people who work in the mining space are are needing overviews like that, and there's not a great place to learn. Um, the, the Brains blog does have a lot of this information, so definitely go check out that section on their website. I want to go back to something you said earlier. You mentioned how a lot of these manufacturers are not customer-friendly, and you're surprised customers aren't pushing some of these larger manufacturers to fix some of their issues. As you guys have gone through the process of building hardware control boards at this step, and I'm assuming other products in the future, what have you learned about the hardware process that might make you sympathetic to some of these larger manufacturers? I would assume that a lot of these larger manufacturers are cutting corners, save on costs. Uh, they're maybe not choosing as powerful things because they want to make it more efficient on their books. Have you seen that or experienced that yourself, or have you become less sympathetic because <laughs> they're kind of ripping people off? Uh, in terms of Producing the hardware itself, uh, definitely some of the engineering decisions. Uh, like I am an embedded systems engineer by heart, so for me the best CPU is the powerful one, right? But that has a certain price tag on it. And if you think about the control board as an important but not essential part of the miner, the essential part are the hash boards. You want to invest the bare minimum into the control board so that it can do the job properly, and that's it. So basically, this determines, let's say the upper bound on your uh, performance on the C of the CPU and the features that you expect from, from the CPU to have. For example, most of the, the hash boards use standard serial communication UART. So uh, you want to have a CPU that, that has, or system on chip that has uh, UART peripherals in hardware in this many instances. You probably don't need 10 of them. You need three to four to six of them uh, just in case. And the, the, the performance of the CPU sort of matches of being able to control, let's say, three, four, con uh, three, four hash boards. 
so we we went really down down this path. Uh, we had to optimize the bill of materials so that we come up to a reasonable price, so that we are able to sell sell the hardware at a reasonable price that's uh, competitive enough. So I, from from this perspective, I do uh, let's say align with the constraints of the full mining machine manufacturers. Um, but uh, what I don't sympathize with is really the fact that like we were actually considering also providing the secure boot, and it's actually somewhere on our list. But again, I would like to take this as an end-user security feature. So end-user security means that sort of not your keys, not your Bitcoin, and not your, let's say, signing keys, not your firmware, not your control board, not your nothing. Mm -hmm. um, so if we ever have this feature, if it's demanded, uh, we would like to have tooling for the users where they are able to generate their signing key, use it, store it securely, and then apply it to their hardware. Obviously, it in order for this feature to be any Anyhow, useful people also have to realize the implications because if, let's say, theoretically we have this secure boot feature with the end user security level where they choose the keys, if they ever sell the, the, the machine uh, for the aftermarket, uh, then obviously they will probably not want to give the keys with with the hardware. So that would make uh, the life of the next person kind of difficult. So you have to realize like all these all these implications, but it could be the case that this feature could be like super important. But so far, um, I even considering like having this uh, is a bit of a theoretical exercise and not like a real use case. So uh, that sort of proves that there is no good reason for the manufacturers to do really exactly this uh, if there's no way to, to disable it. I do understand it, why they do it for warranty reasons, but still, once the warranty expires, then there should be no reason for people to simply be able to wipe out the control board to a level where they can uh, load anything that they want. And, yeah, so, um, go ahead. And to 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 complete the 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 whole thought process, um, there is a, a bit, let's say a significant uplift if you let's say run Brains OS on uh, on an end miner machine uh, compared to the stock firmware, which is somewhere around eight to ten percent just by loading the firmware into the machine, running it at the stock settings. So the stock settings, I mean, the, the the power that is being drawn from the wall, if you run the stock firmware, about the same power is being drawn by, by our firmware, then you should uh, see a uh, performance difference somewhere between 7 to 10 or 8 to 10 percent. We actually have a small chart on our uh, on our uh, eShop uh, that uh, explains it and shows it for, for JPro as a real uh, example. Uh, so, and knowing this, if you say you are a retail user and you would like to get this extra 10% of the BTC because this directly projects, the hash rate projects linearly to, to the BTC that you mine or that in this case you actually don't mine, that's kind of annoying that you don't have that uh, straightforward uh, option or possibility to, to run any aftermarket firmware. Did you know that you can make more money by merge mining other networks? Check out makemoremoneymining.com for information on BIPs 300 and 301, a proposal to bring more revenue to Bitcoin miners through sidechains and merge mining called drive chains. Increase your mining revenues and learn more about participating in Bitcoin governance by visiting makemoremoneymining.com. Are you a miner who wants to activate Bitcoin improvements? Check out activation.watch. See what Bitcoin improvements the Bitcoin community, developers, and miners are considering and show support by signaling for one of many BIPs up for consideration. Activation.watch. Hey, Mining Pod, I'm Lee Bratcher, president of the Texas Blockchain Council. The Texas Blockchain Summit is now the North American Blockchain Summit. The same emphasis on policy, energy, and Bitcoin mining, but now expanded by working with our partners across the country. We've got great sponsors lined up like Riot, Marathon, GDA, CleanSpark, BitDeer, Lantium, Cormant, Compass, HTS, Crypto Power, Priority Power, Sonoda, and many more. Solidify your next deal or JV, or just come for the networking on November 15th through 17th in Fort Worth, Texas, 
for the third annual North American Blockchain Summit. We'll see you there. Definitely. I, I want to talk about the end user for this control board, who's going to purchase it. Mm-hmm. I, I listened to you on what Bitcoin did, and you're talking about like inserting SD cards and see, you know, 10,000 machines. People can do that, but that's not a great process. I imagine swapping control boards. I mean, I've done it myself. It takes a little bit even more time. So when you guys are going out and selling this to the market, how are you thinking about it? You did mention earlier this is like the first part to probably like a larger hardware device. Uh, but how how are you guys thinking about selling this part to customers out there on the market? So uh, it's important to realize that uh, Brains or Slush Pool uh, started from like PLAP miners, right? So they are a significant uh amount of our customers it's it's a community behind uh, all this so these individual miners uh if they uh, made the decision to or when they made the decision to invest money to buy one two three four machines uh, considering the machine prices uh the cost of the control board is something that you can neglect so these would be let's say one of the type that, that's one of one type of the customers that would be willing to buy it because they just are fed up with all these restrictions and policies uh, from Bitmain, for example. Uh, Then uh, second part is uh, the machines itself uh, do have certain failure rate and what fails on the machines ranges from fans, goes through the hash boards, which is the most severe damage to the machines uh, up to the control boards and PSU. And in this case, as a mining farm, if you uh, stock up a brains control board instead of uh, a specific control board uh, from the manufacturer, uh, then this would be basically a replacement part. And you need to have these in stock, basically. So this is another uh, segment of customers. And like you, like you already mentioned, the, for us, the, the whole brains control board is essentially an exercise to prove that we can actually manufacture it, we can manufacture it in quality, and we can manufacture it uh, at a scale where we can deliver it globally, which gotcha. is happening right now. Gotcha. Thanks for that background. Okay, let's talk about hardware for one more second and then move over to talk about Brains Pool. Uh, what are some future things you guys are looking at launching in terms of hardware uh, that's public as of right now? And then what are some like things that you guys are, are looking maybe in like the distant future that you'd be uh, curious about building in Bitcoin? Yeah, well, for sure, what's on the list is a PSU uh, where we see an opportunity to optimize things. Uh, I don't want to talk about the specific details about what it is, what is possible to to optimize, but uh, sometime after or around Q1 2024, uh, we should be delivering first couple hundred uh, to the market, uh, and then we'll basically start from there. And PSU is an essential component for uh, for each mining machine. So then we can sort of extrapolate what should be coming next. And we have been playing with this idea of the full machine uh, for a long, long time. Uh, we did uh, uh, non-essential research behind that, some prototyping of hash boards and so on. So we'll see what's going to happen after that. Gotcha. Okay, let's talk. Move over and talk about Brains Pool. Um, so I was looking at Brains Pool stats this morning, and like historically, you guys are around five percent. This is, I think, according to BTC.com. So that's over the longevity of Slush Pool and Brains Pool yeah. together. Um, over the last year, it's dropped pretty precipitously, and I'm curious to to ask you just like. What do you guys think about that? Um, Obviously, you guys are moving into different product lines and diversifying there. So it's a a strong uh, point in your guys' favor. But how are you guys thinking about uh, the mining pool these days and ways of like strengthening that hash rate? Um, The problem of the uh, of the pools nowadays is unlike the firmware, um, none of the pools have any significant uh, advantage over each other. Right. It's it goes basically just to mere fact. Okay, are your nodes available? Or are they not available? Or highly available? Highly available. Uh, and the second, and I would say most uh, uh, 
frequently spoken topic, and that's the rewarding system. Until now, uh, our pool has been focusing on like we were truly dividing the actual BTC mined uh, within the pool among the miners. So the miners were getting the, the freshly minted coins. Uh, whereas, uh, let's say our competitors, uh, most of them switched over to PPS or FPS, that is pay per share. So essentially, our rewarding scheme right now is based on the, the amount of blocks that we physically mine. And if you participate in, in that round, uh, when the block is found, you get a proportional reward based on the time when you participated and the amount of hash rate, if I oversimplify it. Uh, with the PPS, you're being paid basically for every submit, or we call it share, uh, that has a certain difficulty. So to each share, you can assign a price tag minus the uh, fee of the pool. And uh, regardless if the pool is or is not finding blocks, the miners are basically paid continuously for the delivered results, not for found blocks. Um, so these are the two competing rewarding schemes. Um, the second one, the PPS or FPPS or its alternatives, uh, is definitely more popular among the miners, especially the, the big public companies want to see in their books, uh, let's say, prediction of their revenue, and they don't want to see any variation. The variation steps in uh, when the pool size, uh, let's say, shrinks under 2-3%, which currently and unfortunately uh, is our case. Um, I cannot speak right now to, to too many details regarding the future product development uh, on the pool, but we're actually uh, actively considering a few options what to do uh, and how to attract more hash rate to the pool. And I'm assuming the hardware component has a, a lot to do with this, right? Like bring people into Brains OS, bring people into the control boards, and they get like into your ecosystem, and then they're interested in using the pool. Is there like a feedback loop there for you guys that you think uh, about? For now, um, even it's, it actually exists already now. If you mine with uh, Brains OS on our pool, uh, the pool fees are zero. The problem is in general that the uh, pool fees are approaching zero levels for big scale miners. Uh, so it's very difficult to compete uh, with this. Um, but as you said, yes, if you we are trying to provide the full software stack and firmware stack for Bitcoin mining and actually even pieces of hardware for that. So basically full vertical integration of the product line uh, so that you can start from the pool and going down to the control board or eventually uh, brains mining uh, machine. Um, unfortunately, uh, with the pool, there have to be more incentives to, to join us than just, uh, okay, you'll get a, a branded control board, so you're going to run it through with our pool. And that's also something that we don't any anyhow enforce. So, uh, the the and that's actually a misconception that used to be spread in the past, uh, and I think even by the manufacturers that they were afraid that if you if their users actually install Brains OS onto their machines that they will be forced to mine just with Slush Pool or Brains Pool, which is definitely has never been truth and it's not the case even now. So if you if you run the firmware, you're free to use it with with whatever pool you like. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, the pool industry is obviously pretty cutthroat because like, it's basically driven to zero very quickly um, by what you're doing. So because there's no really edit, there there is currently there's no edit value to to the pool itself. Pool is a service assumed uh, sort of as if you use email today or even WhatsApp or something like that. Like yeah. there is no. Uh, sure, if there was another WhatsApp, probably people would not start using it, right? Because that needs some critical mass with the pools. That's slightly different uh, uh, situation. Speaking of fifty-one person attack and so on, there, like uh, after a certain size, the pools are not attractive. But that's the case for the retail miners. Uh, the the big miners do care about the, let's say, uh, deterministic and predictive uh, way of knowing 
what's the revenue is going to be. Definitely. Yeah. So on, on one hand you have that, they want the, they want the revenue and they want to know the revenues there and like their shareholders and all that want to know that that's going to happen. There's not going to be any bad luck. On the other hand, we do have some new things coming to Bitcoin right now and it's fairly uh, speculative at this point. Right. So we have like ordinals and inscriptions. Uh, there's been talk about like drive chains, things like that. Does brains look at any of this and have any considerations about these things? Are you guys pretty like pure play vanilla interested on your, on your books right now? Cause there are some other pools that are like becoming interested in and working on these concepts. Um, and I'm wondering if like there's a, an avenue for brains to get involved with that, or if you guys are just going to wait and send the sidelines for now. Well, for now we're trying to be focused on the mining tools, but yeah. sure. Uh, like any of these things, if they come our way and sort of make, uh, any sense from business perspective, uh, that's something that like we're actively like monitoring the situation, especially with the drive chains. I want to point out, I'm not an expert on drive chains. Um, uh, so Sure, there's a discussion about BIP300 uh, as, as far as I know. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting things going on uh, around this topic. But again, um, our domain, our uh, way we make uh, money for daily life and living is uh, Bitcoin mining. So that's where we try to focus and we try not to get distracted uh, even by uh, interesting and important topics but that's not our business line as of now speaking of business lines i want to ask a little bit about how you guys think about winners and losers and proc lines uh, there's a few things here going on one you guys have multiple different revenue streams right from control board manufacturing you guys are going to perhaps produce an ASIC in the future. You guys have uh, brains pool. Um, there's other things you guys do. And then also you're in a commodity market, right? Where like the price goes up for a while and then it goes down. We're in a bear market for three or so years. How do you guys think about building and funding out these, these different product lines, given that we're in such a dynamic market? I assume from like a, a founder's perspective and as a business perspective, it'd be really hard to juggle all this stuff. Uh, but you know it's important. You know it's important to put your bets on building things for the future, even when right now there's not a lot of money coming in. Uh, but yeah, in general, just curious how you guys think about that. <laughs> no, so first of all, you're right. Uh, it's definitely a very involved and difficult topic. It's a repeating topic that we're internally discussing basically all the time because it's important to really understand all these uh, tiny uh, and very important details. Uh, one aspect that we did uh, in the past uh, is that like, we don't like to spend really the coins that we uh, that we mine, and uh, to some extent, we were willing to uh, let's say substitute the the, the coin uh, selling by taking loans in the form of uh, bonds, and that's still an ongoing activity. Uh, obviously, still the revenue of the company has to be on the upper side so that we can be sure that we can pay back our liabilities, but still. Uh, Considering that we do uh, trust in Bitcoin future, uh, I don't want to say like I don't know when when it's going to be 100k, but right? <laughs> but uh, still, uh, slowing down the pace of burning the BTC in exchange for uh, for fiat to a sustainable level uh, of depth of the company uh, that's something that uh, I think that is the proper approach so basically balancing these two things you you have to sell a little bit uh, but at the same time uh, it's convenient uh, for uh, bigger uh, investment things to take some extra and external money yeah definitely like right on the top of your guys' website has the bond section which is yep. It's definitely interesting. And the first thing I think about it is back in 2021, all these Bitcoin miners took out, like they went public, uh, they sold equity, and they've done lots of dilution to be able to raise. And obviously, these are different markets. Uh, these are self miners versus you guys running a pool and hardware business and maybe some self mining as well, but it's not the largest component of your business. That being said, how do you guys think about equity versus raising with debt? especially when in time when debt is so expensive right now. Uh, I, I think a lot of Bitcoin miners are now looking at debt thinking like maybe that's like the more ethical solution, but it might not be as pragmatic as, uh, as an equity raise. <laughs> equity obviously has its downsides, right? Where you're, like you're selling any part of your business, you're selling losing, your you're control. You're losing control, right? Uh, yeah. 
I would say again, uh, it's a combination. Uh, I want to point out that we didn't take any external equity until now. So the company is solely owned by the two co-founders. Um, it may change uh, depending on how we proceed with the mining hardware, uh, because that's like I I honestly don't uh, understand like software companies taking uh, or giving away equity uh, instead of like let's say working harder and like, finding your way around um, to generate some revenue. But for the hardware story, I think it's at some point it becomes like very capital intensive. And I, I would say like this is the moment where it it's actually legit to make the decision to give up some equity. And uh, this is what has been happening with uh, the big mining uh, operations, where it was essentially the combination of both. And I think the businesses that went solely down the depth path are now in the trouble because at some point when uh, the bear market hit, uh, they were not able to uh, pay back, for, like basically to service their loans, not not even speaking of paying back. So yeah, crazy I think a healthy, healthy, yes. And uh, I, I would say a healthy combination of both is uh, the right approach. So we are actually considering the, the adding the second part uh, uh, when the right time comes. Gotcha. Yeah, it's crazy to think back about some of these big Bitcoin miners taking on large amounts of debt, Bitcoin price drops, and then the Fed increase interest rates at the same time. It was just like a perfect pain cycle for them. Yes. Uh, at the same time, it's uh, you want to control your destiny, so giving up equity is kind of tough. Uh, we've also seen a lot of people misuse uh, equity raises or through dilution. Okay, I have to ask, last question, uh, when, what's minor? <laughs> Okay, that's a hard one. Uh, <laughs> the <laughs> it's not two weeks. Let's say six months, something like that. Uh, it's what I, what I, I'll try to describe it like this. Uh, we have uh, certain priorities that bring the most revenue. I'm not saying that what's minor is not a good source of revenue for our business model with the firmware. Uh, again, but what's minor is one of the manufacturers or micro is one of the manufacturers that lock uh, their hardware as well. Um, so even if you have the mining, you would still struggle with the installation. What is actually very, very, uh, let's say, intensive on the what's minor side is that they make so many flavors of the hardware, like like basically really uh, the, the, the amount of combinations is huge and supporting all that is, I don't want to say it's impossible. It is possible. The question is about the cost. So sure, we are always somewhere in the background working on the what's minor, but currently it didn't have a, a priority for us. So I don't know, six months is, uh, is a good bet. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to ask me next time. <laughs> I will ask you next time. And uh, okay. I'm sure we get some tweets based on this show. Uh, I, I have to ask also, I said that was the last question, but one more I just thought of is like, you know, we had the S21 just announced the other week and I'm sure you were in the crowd in Hong Kong when that was yes. announced. A any thoughts on that uh, as we're closing here on some of the new the M60, uh, Kane put a new machine out um, and then the new Bitmade lineup? So we were at the announcement of Canaan uh, in Singapore uh, that has a very impressive number of joules per terahash as well. I think all the three manufacturers are trying to catch up with each other in terms of the efficiency. Um, with always with the launch of the the first batch of the machines, it's going to be that's like the surprise moment, and essentially, I I would say it's a bet. Uh, how the machines are going to be uh, really effective or efficient and uh, what would be the quality of the hardware? Would there be any hardware issues? Uh, uh, would there be any failure rate on delivery and so on? So I'm quite uh, excited uh, to see what's going to hit the market. And what is actually even more interesting aspect is uh, the, by the time this is going to hit the market, we will be very close before the next halving. So essentially, the, the current price may not be 
speaking of the price of the hardware, may not be the price of the hardware at the halving. So uh, a lot of interesting things definitely are going to happen in the next uh, eight to nine months. Let's so hope price on both of the things go up in the, in the near future. Fairly least Bitcoin price. Jan, thank you so much for joining the Mining Pod. I uh, appreciate all your insights and the, and the detail on the control boards, the brains pool, all the way uh, to talking about S21. Thank you for having me.